duplicated. There were only certain powerful movements of God, because God always wins, like it or not, that Satan was unable to duplicate. Because whenever it comes to the bottom line, the absolute bottom line, God wins. It doesn't matter what we think or what we believe or what we practice or who we think we are because of our practices. When it comes down to the nitty gritty, God is gonna win, like it or not. He's who he is and he wins, period. That's just the truth of the matter. Satan is angry and he's out to cause a disturbance and destruction wherever he can. And his vision, his point is the young people. He wants the young people. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, it would seem that he is on the side where the young are really flocking and checking out his power. You just had a write-up in, 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 in England, I believe, where two boys lured a two-year-old, how many know what I'm talking about, God help us, out of a mall, beat him to death, and put him on a railroad tracks because he wanted to see a train cut him in half. Somebody's two-year-old little baby. In America, we got a boy that is in the court system right now that we're trying with the death penalty, we're trying him as an adult, who took his neighbor's son, how many read about that? Kid with the red hair and the glasses? Beat him and said he enjoyed watching him die. He says he was reading Stephen King books. So we have to face the fact, without any ado, that Canada and the United States, since that's where I'm from and you're from, are having a problem with witchcraft. It is an absolute problem. People think it's cool. I thought it was totally cool to be a witch. You could never have convinced me when I was practicing witchcraft that it wasn't cool to be a witch. I was convinced that walking around operating in psychic power, operating in mediumship, which is to tell fortunes to people when they're sitting in front of you or tell their past, present, or future, to be channeling voices through me, to invite spirits within me, to communicate with what I thought was the dead, to be able to do spells and incantations, to ask to project, to meditate, was cool. And most people that knew me thought that I was cool because I did these things. The only problem is when you take up with the devil's kingdom, which is darkness, because God doesn't have any of that stuff going on in his kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, there's black and there's white and there is no gray. There's either the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. There is no in-between ground. You cannot say that spiritualism is not serious and that it's okay because in the book, God clearly states that he's against all of it. Now you can go to the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy and he'll tell you he has nothing to do with any of that. So anyone practicing it, being entertained by it, partaking of it or seeking after it is definitely not in his kingdom, but in the kingdom of darkness. And when you dabble in the kingdom of darkness, as I know, cause I've been there, the devil is not a nice guy. He doesn't like anyone. He doesn't think you teenagers are cool. He doesn't want to give you anything you're not going to pay for. He has absolutely no ability to love anybody. He is the epitome of hate. When those kids took that baby and laid it on the railroad tracks, God had nothing to do with it. He is the epitome of hate, and he will promise you that he will give you everything you want if you go along these channels of his kingdom. And it doesn't work that way, because I tried it, and he will turn on you in a heartbeat. He'll get you right where he wants you operating in these things, thinking that it's wonderful, thinking you got all this wonderful power, seeing it work, and he will come in and he will let you know in no uncertain terms that he's going to kill you. Now, if you're out there and you're practicing and saying, this isn't happening to me, come and see me in a few years. This guy don't share nothing with anybody. He's a God, not a God as we know God, but he's an evil deity who hates mankind and has one desire for your future, and that is to kill you. I don't care what you give him, he will kill you because he is the epitome of hate. You must know that, young people. 
You can't walk in darkness and expect to get anything good out of it. You don't make packs with evil for good. There is no way. White and black, choose which one you're going to kiss. 1931. The Bible says, regard them not. That means have nothing. Now, this is God talking. Ladies and gentlemen, this is God talking. This isn't somebody just out there. This is the almighty God who has drawn this whole universe together and is holding everything in the palm of his hand. He says to you, regard them not that have familiar spirits. That means don't have anything to do with them. Neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God, period. Now turn to Deuteronomy, if you will, 18 and 10. And let's start out with what God says before I get on my own tangent here. Since he is the ultimate authority. Deuteronomy 18.10 There shall not be found among you one that makes his son or daughter to pass through the fire. That's a pagan ritual, right? Or uses divination. Or as an observer of times or an enchanter. Observer of times means astrology or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits that's who someone who deals with the dead or a wizard or a necromancer that is talking and communicating with the dead for all those that do these things are an abomination to the lord and because of these abominations the lord will drive them out before you because of them, he's going to drive them out. Now, between 1575 and the 1700s, millions of alleged witches were put to death. Basically, a lot of them overseas as well as here. Now, the first thing we need to understand is, where was the first signs of Satanism in the Bible? Where were the absolute first signs of warnings that something different was going on that should be going on? Where did man make the decision not to give all of his worship to the Creator. In the 10th chapter of Genesis, you will find the story of Nimrod. In that chapter, it says that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And most people think that that means that he was a really nice guy. No, it doesn't. Nimrod was against God. He came against God. He told men that their happiness did not come from God at all, but from him. And he set up sun worship. They say that the Tower of Babel that was built in his time, at the very top of it were all the signs of the zodiac, all astrological signs. And Nimrod taught people, don't worship the creator, worship the created thing. Worship the sun, the stars, the moon, the wind, fire. Don't worship him who created these things, but worship the things that have been created. And so man began to look up and look at the stars and believe that according to whatever formation they were in when he was born had a lot to do with his destiny because that's where it began. Look at the created thing. You are part of all of this, and this, these stars have something to do with your life. Therefore, you should follow them and watch after them. Thus, you have astrology. People, let me tell you something about astrology. Do you know what the word bogus means? It means it's a line of baloney. 98% of astro astrology that you read in the papers and you look into is bogus. It really is. Tell me who's up there studying the stars so good, watching that close. Some have gotten into them, but basically it's bogus. It's a money-making racket. If you accidentally read the wrong sign, it'll pertain to you too. <laughs> you think about it, just accidentally, just for snicks, as we say in New York. Read the wrong one. I bet you'll say yes, that does. And you'll see, it's something general that will pertain to just about all the thousands and thousands of readers that are reading it that day. But he taught people, don't look at God. Get your eyes off God. And get your eyes on the things that have created. So men began to look at the sun and worship the sun. 
The Greek goddess Diana is the god of the sun. And witches worship her. She's one of the goddesses. Worship the stars. And thus the very beginning of the transference of worshiping God to the created thing. Now when you stop giving your worship to him who is worthy and who has created everything and is, inhabits all of eternity, when you take your worship off of him and you start putting on the things that he has made, it becomes demonic, period. No its, ands, or buts, folks. The minute you take it off, get this, because you're not going to understand witchcraft. Witchcraft isn't a bunch of witches flying around on brooms. When you take it off that, and many witches believe and worship Diana, the goddess of the sun. They worship the moon. They worship the stars. They worship the elements. They worship the wind. They worship fire. These are the things that they believe in and they put their faith in, and none of them believe in Jesus Christ as the son of God. None. After Nimrod started this, it started just a growth in mankind. And I have never ceased to be amazed at how quickly it picks up in cultures. How many have ever heard of Aleister Crowley? He's from England. I think he's still got a castle out there, doesn't he, somewhere? Jimmy uh, Page from the Led Zeppelin group lived in his castle for a while. Aleister Crowley worshiped the devil openly. He had a big castle in which in his castle he had a library of all the books that had been written, anything that ever been written on Satanism. He was totally into the devil. He had tattooed across his head 666, the sign of the beast. Aleister Crowley practiced Satanism for many years and in the course of these years he became a heroin addict. Isn't the devil nice? The guy was a heroin addict. He became so caught up in heroin and shooting heroin that he could take enough heroin into his body to kill a full bull elephant and live. He died of a, a disease in his urine. It poisoned his whole system and he died a terrible, tormented death. He was green when he died from the sickness that poisoned his human body. Now there was a man here on this side of the world named Anton LaVey. How many know Anton LaVey is? He lived in California, in San Francisco, and he read up on Aleister Crowley. He thought he was totally cool. You know, this guy, Aleister Crowley, had this, this wonderful library of, of, the, of the rights, the satanic rights. So Anton LaVey purchased and got his hands on some of the books, read them, studied them, and he said, I want to be just like this. So he took his white clapboard house in San Francisco and painted the thing black from top to bottom. Just top to bottom, he painted it black. He invited many celebrities out of Hollywood and a lot of his friends, and for two weeks they had orgies and parties. He was the host of these great parties. They say that many celebrity names were there for two solid weeks. When everyone left, he set himself up to be a priest of witchcraft. He wrote the Satanic Bible, The Complete Witch, and The Satanic Rituals. He wrote three books. Thus, it swept, this thing with witchcraft is swept across the United States in the 70s, just swept and started seeping all over the place because everybody thought he was really cool. In fact, he's got a friend that used to be in his church called Michael Aquino, A-Q-U-I-N-O. How many have ever heard of him? He's got the hair pointed here. He's been on all the major talk shows. You know what I'm talking about? He's in the military. Michael left. Yes, he did. Michael's got this pointed hair, and he says that he believes in a literal devil and the powers of Satan, and he started the Temple of Sect. And he's been on all the major talk shows, claiming that he has nothing to do with blood, doesn't hurt anybody. All he does is worships the devil. You can't worship the devil for any length of time that he doesn't start making requests and, and, and you have to live up to him, period. Ask a couple of people that are locked up for life today, facing lifetime sentences. I got saved, I had a woman come to my house. She walked in. 
She looked around and I had all kinds of things from my past. I didn't know. I had uh, hands made out of pure silver that were used at, 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 at satanic rituals. I didn't know that I used for tapper candles for certain spells. I had cobra candles. Richard and I had our spirits written on pewter dishes and stuff and very expensive stuff Richard's mother has bought for, had bought for us when I was in the occult. Really, really, she just went out and bought the stuff. Well, this woman walked in and she looked around and she said, now innocent stuff like, like a pewter cup with my name on it, with the name of my spirit guide so-called on it and my astrological sign. You wouldn't think anything was wrong with that. It was just a pewter cup. But she said to me, why do you have this in your house? What are you going to do with this? I said, I don't know. Is there anything wrong with it? She said, Carol, why would you want any of that in your house? Garbage bag, man. I just garbage bagged it all. I'll bet you Richard and I threw out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Because I'm going to tell you something. Ain't no money, ain't no price tag that's going to let the devil in my house, period. I don't care how long it's been in the family. Now, when I was involved in witchcraft, many times, just to solid this up, many times an object would either be spoken over, it would have a significant value. If you could get it from a certain place, always little objects, pictures and things that you think are totally innocent seem to be intriguing. So I would collect them. And many people who practice the arts like me would do the same. And many times we would use them to speak over them or, or to do something with them. Watch what you decorate with. If it's in there and it makes you feel the tiniest little bit of the heebie-jeebies, get it out. Get it out. You might say to yourself, oh, Carol, don't you think you're exaggerating? Let's hit the Bible. The Bible always has good facts. Joshua is going to war. God says, Joshua, you will always be successful. Wherever you go, you will win against the enemy. However, do not take certain things into the camp. When you go in and take a nation, there are certain things I do not want you to touch. Don't take it into my camp where my people are. So Joshua goes out to war with the armies of Israel and they win and they win and they win and they win. What was a guy named Achan who didn't listen to the voice of God because he was greedy. It says that Achan brought home to the camp bars of gold and silver. Now, you don't get bars of gold and silver out of someone's house. He was in the temple. That's where the bars of gold and silver are. Study your Bible. You'll see I'm right. It also says they took a Babylonian, very colorful garment, like a coat. Whenever anything in the temple dealt with a particular deity, you would put out a mantle and you'd go before the deity and worship him. And on the back of your coat usually was a picture of that deity or something that was attached to that. Well, Achan didn't think there was anything wrong with it, man. Hey, it was really expensive and really nice. And what's the harm? It's just a thing. And he took it and he snuck it into the camp of Israel and hid it in his tent. No big thing, just a cape, just cloth, just weaved. What's the problem, folks? Well, the problem is whenever Israel went out to fight again, the enemy overtook them. Now watch, it overtook them. They were losing against the enemy. So Joshua gets all upset and falls down on his face and starts blaming God, which a lot of us do, including me. Well, why is this happening? After all, you're the one who said go into the nations. You're the one who said we'd always win. You're the one who said we have the victory. Why are men dying? What's happening? God said to Joshua, read it, get up off the floor now like a man stand up. He said, you have the accursed thing in the camp. Get it out. Now, what's the problem, folks? It's just a Babylonian robe. What's the problem? What the problem is, is God said, a, there are things attached to those things, and I don't want them amongst my people, because when they're amongst my people and you go against the enemy, you lose. You got cancer in the house, financial difficulty, rebellious children, sickness, Poverty, oppression, depression. Check and see if you have the accursed thing in your house. And then when you come against the enemy, you won't lose. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, there is connections to these things. And I could go on and on. We need as a church to go home and clean house. You teenagers who have all these trashy CDs and tapes in the house 
that are rotting your brains and making these unsaved men and women richer than you could ever imagine in your wildest dreams. It's time to get the trash out of your house. If they don't worship your God, who is their God? What does light have to do with darkness? Why are you being entertained by them? Of what good or what worth can they be to you other than they love your money? So it's time for us as children of the king to go home and to look at what we're decorating with. Jewelry amazes me. Now, help me with this so I can show, so I can show them this. They're bringing back the peace signs. Turn that off if you would, baby. Now, remember I said he's so subtle. He just... He amazes me sometimes. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. That's a cute peace sign. A little broken. The circle should be perfect. But anyway, they're bringing the peace sign. Peace. Peace. It was big in the 60s. Let me tell you how this thing is used in witchcraft. When one comes to denounce Christianity to enter into the work of the devil or to enter into his dark kingdom, there is at times a pagan ritual that goes on. What they will do to that Christian who is now denouncing their align, you know, being aligned with Christ and now enter into, entering into Satan's world, they'll take a porcelain, very poor glass crucifix and they'll turn it upside down. And then the person who's denouncing Christ takes both sides of the crucifix and breaks it to break their alliance with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Thus, the peace sign. And I'm sure there's other definitions and other symbols, but that's one of them. I don't want that thing in my house. The last thing on earth I want to do is play around with my salvation. Bible enough tells me to work it out. I don't want any more trouble. I've got enough to deal with on a daily basis walking with my precious Savior. Break it right in half. You stand there and you, I don't even want to say it, but you denounce your Christian life. You denounce the Son of God. You denounce the power of the blood and you break it. And people are walking around with these things on. So the other one, that's, and, and there's another one that's getting real popular now. And, and the kids think it's like really cool, you know? What do I wipe this with, sweetheart? If you don't know either, well, that's fine. Here comes the usher. Is this guy quick? He's so precious. Fear not! Don't you like that fear not? Do you know fear not is 300? <laughs> Is it not coming out? 366 times in the Bible, one for every day and one for leap year. Did you know that? Okay, we'll go to a new place. Did you know that about fear not? It's in the Bible six, 366 times, one for every day. Don't be afraid of the devil, guys. This is the big one that the kids think like, wow, man, this is really so cool, you know, man. That is really awesome, isn't it, man? <laughs> no law, no government, no nothing. Do you know how big this sign is now, guys? This is where our kids' minds are at. No law, no government, no rules. We bell, we bell, we bell. That's, that's hot. The kids think this is great, they'll put it on the front. And I'm not putting the kids down. I'm telling you, this is, this is the big thing now. Anarchy, nothing. No, you, don't, you don't in any shape or form have any rules. And if your parents get in your way, kill them. You know, if you think I'm overreacting, Jesus said himself, that there'll come a day that the children will kill their parents, didn't he? Didn't he? Take it up with him. And it's happening, isn't it? He said, start watching when that happens because it's very close. Sean Sellers was a normal, beautiful boy growing up. He was a cute little blonde kid with big blue eyes, sweet as they come, had a nice family, a nice mother, a nice father, what they might refer to as a normal life. One day, Sean decided he wanted to be cool. I, I, I can't stand that, that up there like that. He wanted to be cool, thought it was going to be, it was so important. Thank you, sweetheart. We might need another one. Will we? Need, you got another one? So he started taking up ninja. Now, ladies and gentlemen, ninja is the art of assassination. Do you realize that? Karate is the art of warring with your hands and feet to the degree to cripple, paralyze, or kill your opponent. Got Christians going to karate classes. What is that? Listen, the Bible says you're more than a conqueror. 
The Bible says you can do all things through Christ. The Bible says that the angel of the Lord encampeth around those who fear him and deliver them. The Bible says that you have a covenant with God of protection and healing and deliverance. You don't need karate. It isn't necessary. I was telling the people yesterday, they're bringing it in the churches now. People come in in karate outfits and fight karate stances. And the churches are putting it on their podiums. We're doing it for Jesus. I don't think so. If anybody knew karate and could have done karate if he really wanted to, Jesus Christ could have caused a bolt of lightning from one end of the universe to the other and explode the earth and the whole universe since all things are held together by him. And nothing came into being that wasn't made through him and by him. Considering who he is, he didn't have any problem and he knew what to do. And he never once said, if they come at you, teach them karate. It isn't in the word. If it isn't in the word, it isn't in the word. That's why your kids shouldn't be playing with ninja turtles. Ninja. What else? Then there's the stars. Tell me yesterday. I love the drawing. This is fun. When everybody leaves, I'll be all by myself drawing little cartoons. New pens, New pens too. I'm so. Do these work better? Yeah. Like, do these wipe off? Yes. Cheers. We get the top off. Oh, thank you so much. Here you go, sweetheart. That one's for you. Okay, we got another one here. It's another one that. And I was telling the people last night, but I want to draw some of these, so that. Oh, I drew it. Uh, tell me, there's a slick there. Did I draw it on the on the mirror? Watch the, oh, there is a slick. Okay. <laughs> We're going to take an offering because Carol ruined our light. This is a big one, too. And I was telling the people yesterday, I'm going to interject it because I am showing some signs and symbols, that this is the crescent moon, Diana, the goddess of the moon, goddess of the moon. And the star is the star of Lucifer, which witches and warlocks will say to you, that's not to be confused with Lucifer of the Bible. It's Pan, the shepherd of the woods. You know, and which one that is? It's, and, and you see this, it's, it's that one uh, weirdo that has the hoofs for legs. And, and, and it's Pan. They, they worship him. This is the, some of the deities. And this, I was telling people, you will find on a pointed hat, which indicates the cone of power. And I was telling the people yesterday that the first time I ever saw that, was on Mickey Mouse in The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Get your eyes open, ladies and gentlemen. First time I ever saw it, Mickey Mouse. See how subtle he is? Isn't it cute? Isn't karate cute? My little boy's got a cute little white outfit on and he's choking people and hitting people in the juggler and hurting people. Isn't that cute? We don't need Jesus. We just need karate and the Ninja Turtles and the ooze. Sam Hayen is said to be the god of the dead and on Halloween Eve he called up all the evil wicked spirits to come out of the ground and to walk the earth. Now in Great Britain and over on that side of the world many years ago were the Celts, Celts, I guess you call them the Celts, C-E-L-T-S. And they were a group of people who had priests called the Druids. The Druids were blood-drinking, horribly evil priests. They used to take full wicker baskets and put human beings in them and put covers on them and light the baskets where you could hear the human beings screaming for mercy all around the villages. This was an offering to the god Samhain on the eve, which is Halloween. That holiday was so important to the Celts that their priests would go from house to house demanding treats and offerings so that those people within that house would not be harmed. This is what would happen, ladies and gentlemen. The Druids, who worshipped the devil, who had nothing to do with God, who had dragged the Celts into that abominable life, on that eve would teach them that these spirits, these goblins, would walk the earth. And in order to appease them, it was important to offer something to those wicked spirits. It started out where the people would leave just treats, little, maybe food, be 
because these wicked spirits they believed could spoil the milk that came from the cow, could cause death in the home, could cause all kinds of diseases to their animals and their farms and their, their families. So they'd start by leaving little treats out to appease them. Well, as wickedness grew and the people gave in to this diabolical thing, those treats weren't enough. They began to demand animal sacrifices. And so the people now, and the Druids now, would begin to offer animal sacrifice, shedding blood on the 31st. They would sometimes cut off the head of a goat and put it up on a stick because that was a representation to their god, Semhayan. These were offerings of treats to him to appease him that he would not, and his wicked spirits would not do damage or cause havoc in the villages. As men gave in more to this, that was not enough. Now they wanted humans, human sacrifices. And this is what would happen, ladies and gentlemen. On the night of Samhain, when the wicked spirits would be summoned to walk the earth, they believed they were departed spirits of loved ones. They were not departed spirits. They were demons. When they would come up out of the ground, they would walk around. Well, now the Druids, to go along with these wicked spirits, would dress up. They'd paint their faces in ghoulish looks and walk around in ghoulish clothing and pointed caps. They'd walk around in the night to appease the wicked spirits. On this particular evening, they would go to people's homes, knock on their door, and demand that that night before midnight, a virgin in that family be offered as a sacrifice to Samhain. They would leave, and they'd leave a little jack-o'-lantern. Don't miss all this. A jack-o'-lantern with a ghoulish carving in the face and a little piece of maybe human fat in the bottom, a coal in the bottom of that jack-o'-lantern, lighting up the ghoulish face and telling the people, this is here as a sign that we'll be back at midnight. If you don't produce the virgin, if you don't appease us, your whole family will die and they would go off with that little cute little jack-o'-lantern we all carve at Halloween, sitting there. When they returned at midnight, if the virgin daughter was not given for sacrifice, that her blood be spilled, a hexagram would be drawn on the door in blood. A hexagram, not a pentagram, a hexagram, which means there's a hex against the family. There's a difference. Not that it means much to us Christians who have the blood of Jesus, but for information's sake, they put a hexagram on the door in blood, and that would mean that by morning, everyone in the house would perish, that they had put a hex against that family. This is what we partake in when we celebrate the 31st. I want you to think about what I just said. The dress up is what the Druids used to do. When you dress up the children, that's what the Druids do. They dress up and walk around in ghoulish outfits. They go from house to house requesting Trick or treat. That is a mantra. That is a, rep that is a repetitious comment that is made. Give us, and what the kids are doing today when they go out dressed up is they're imitating the Druids. They're taking part of Sam Hayne's holiday. You can't fix it, folks. You can't scrub it down. This is what they're doing. Little Christian children are walking around dressed up chanting trick or treat, partaking in the holiday of the eve of the God of the dead. There's no getting around it. The jack-o'-lanterns that are carved are said to be the ones that they, you know, in, in, in lieu of the jack-o'-lanterns that were carved, put on people's front porches. Now we carve them and put them up there, you know, just set them out there, never realizing what we're partaking in. The pointed hat that some of the children wear, the witch hats, and sometimes we'd put them up in our windows, the cute little witch. Well, the pointed hat means the cone of power. That means anyone wearing that pointed hat operates in divination and sorcery. The witch on the broom that many times we'd hang up in our windows or sometimes women would buy the little kitchen witches for good luck and hang them up in their kitchens. The witch broom means that she asks to project, she spirit travels from one location to another that goes all the way back to the Columbian age. The little Casper ghouls that we put up with the little smiles that look real cute with their little, at the bottom they don't have legs but it almost looks like an upside down sheet. 
That represents the spirits coming up out of the ground, but they look real cute, don't they? They make them with real cute little faces. They look like Casper the ghost. We stick that up on the windows, and then that in our, 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 our schools, and then that in our different places. That represents the spirits coming up out of the ground. The black cat is believed by witches, and I, when I hung around with a girl named Linda who was practicing with me for a while, and she kind of got off and I got into it very heavily when I moved into Lancaster, but we believed that it was very easy to transfer our spirits into the cats, or transfer, or that spirits could get into animals. The bat that they, we hang so cute, you know, that little bat hanging and his wings go, is usually referring to the vampire bat. Whenever you're involved in darkness, you like creatures of darkness, black cats, bats, vampire bats that drink blood. I've been doing these seminars and I've got more kids that fill this place that are into vampirism and are drinking blood. Did you know that I got a letter from a girl I can read you that's been drinking blood since she's 17 years old. She says she can't stop. Somebody's daughter that everybody thought would never get into it started messing around and now she's begging to get out. The pointed hat, the, 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 the lantern, the trick or treat. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something about Halloween. You can't redeem it. You should, people, when it comes, you shouldn't even act like it's there. If the churches choose to give us, make a sanctuary or a refuge so that you can come out of the activity out there and we come into the church, it should not be referred to as a Halloween party and the children should not be dressing up as anything, not even shepherds, not even angels. Because the minute you start, you take on the festival. And I'm telling you something, witches think it's funny. Well, my little girl's an angel. Your little girl's dressed up on the eve of Sam Hay and man. That's what your little girl is. That's exactly what witches would think or those practicing the art. When we try to play this, well, we're having a Christian party and our kids are getting dressed up. No, you're dressing your kids up and you're celebrating their holiday. It shouldn't even be recognized. It shouldn't even be paid attention to. It is an evil, evil holiday. We're losing our kids. I just came back from L.A. Just came back from being with Dwight Thompson in L.A. Did his kickoff meeting out in L.A. Stayed out there for a week at the end of October and just did missions. I did everything from pick up garbage to hold babies in my arms whose parents had taken bats to their faces for discipline. Really, guys, large hot irons burnt their arms for discipline. They came with irons. It looked like the mother was ironing their arm that afternoon. Little kids barefooted, beat up, cut up. I had teenagers that had kids before they were old enough to brush their own teeth. Girls coming in, young teenagers dragging kids with them. She must have been pregnant at 10. And what I observed in LA, I've been in Chicago with Dwight Thompson, we've been in some of the major cities. What I have observed is the kids, we're losing them. They're desensitized, they're cold, Except for those, of course, I'm sure you're sitting here going, I'm not so sensitized, Carol Konacki. I love God. Yes, there are those too. But the majority of the kids in the earth, we're losing them. Do you realize our kids are killing babies? Do you realize what I'm saying to you? Those boys took that baby. I, I'm still, I just heard this yesterday, so it's fresh in my mind. I know you all been reading it for months. I didn't know that. Debbie, because Meritsu told me at her house yesterday about this. I said, Debbie, we've lost our children. We got an MTV generation. We're losing our kids. Kids are being, their minds are being taken right out of their heads and they're being pickled. I, I don't envy anyone with small children because of the condition of this world. I bless your children. I thank God for your children. I know he's got a hedge of protection around them, but I'm saying I don't envy anybody with small children. Look at the condition of this world. Think about it. And do you know where it's really centralized? The kids. The kids. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, you got to get out of the mentality that witchcraft is always a cauldron in the woods. People running around in the nude. It's that too. But there is a diabolical plan, and it is in motion even as we speak. And the devil is not stupid. He wants to bring down the church of Jesus Christ.
You see, you are his target. He wants to take these young people that are committed to Jesus Christ and change their way of thinking. Now, if he comes in with a long red tail and he has big horns and a growly mouth and he walks down here, you're going to recognize him and you're going to avoid him. So he can't do that. But he's got to get into your home and into your church and into your mind. So being the adversary he is, and being around as long as he has, and having what cheap diabolical wisdom that he has put together, he has to get into your home, church, and he does it every day by your TV set. Every day. That television is probably one of the most powerful instruments in that house it can take you to japan by pulling a button it can fly you in a jet over the ocean it can take you inside a womb of a woman with a tiny little tiny little thing a little camera and show you how a child is born but everything that comes over your tv set is not pleasant and beautiful i have never in my life if you would have told me 15 years ago they'd use the language that they do on TV, I wouldn't have believed you. I can't believe it. I take the garbage out once a day. You turn the TV set on, you've got to take the garbage out constantly. What comes into your homes. Let's look a little bit. I want to share a little bit how witchcraft, Satanism, and violence, listen, if you read this, you're going to find that the whole personality of the devil is violence. He's violent. The Bible says that when God destroyed the earth by water, when he looked out, he saw that men were violent, that violence covered the earth. There was total violence. And because of that violence, he totally destroyed the earth, less eight people. The heartbeat of the devil is violence. Listen to me. That's his heartbeat. Because if he can get the seeds of violence into your mind or into your kids or into your babies, he's already got them. Hitler said, you want to take a nation? Take the kids. Get to the kids. He made sure his voice was heard constantly. Do you know he did more talking than sleeping? Every time they opened their ears in Germany, they heard his voice constantly speaking into them. Constantly. He said, you want nations? Take their youth. Napoleon said the same thing. You want to wipe out a nation? Take the kids. Get the kids. Hitler had kids go nine and ten years old to their death totally desensitized. Just go out and fight and die in 10 minutes in the battlefield. The cause for him. You can take the kids, you can take a nation, ladies and gentlemen. And right now your kids, and you kids sitting out here, you're in danger. Unless we all start making some real serious changes about what we claim Christianity is and what it really is to us. Do you know, I turned on the TV in Canada. I turned it on in, I, everywhere I go, I travel all over the place. I travel constantly. I was telling Ray today, we haven't stopped since May. I mean, we started in May sometimes. I looked at my calendar, it seems like we never quit. It just keeps going. And I don't mind. You know, I am more than glad to, do the, to work the kingdom of God. But I says, wherever I go and I turn on that TV, on a Saturday morning, I like to turn it on. I like to see what's happening. Have you watched your cartoons, ladies and gentlemen? They're full of magic sorcery. Do you see what your kids are being taught? Do you know Papa Smurf, who everybody just loves because he's so cute and blue, got in a confrontation with some of the neighbors in one of the cartoons? Now, your little baby, your babies, these precious babies, I'm going to start with the kids, I'm going to work up to the teenagers and then the adults. By the time we're done, God's going to sweep through this place. I'll tell you, you just won't believe what the Holy Ghost will do when you start cleaning house. But your little babies, your little innocent children, 
were sitting in front of the TV at 7 o'clock in the morning. These kids that are in Sunday school on Sunday, these Sunday school teachers, bless their precious darling little hearts, are trying to teach your children to love one another, to stay out of confrontations. If you get in a confrontation, use peace. They tell them that the God is love. Love your enemies. They're filling your babies all Sunday with the word, the word, the word, teaching them to draw pictures. Hug Johnny if you get in a fight. Love him! Then they go home, and on Saturday morning, just before church, the TV goes on. And then they see Papa Smurf, who's so cute, come out, and he's in a confrontation with some of the other Smurfs. So what Papa Smurf does is he draws a hexagram in the sand. How many saw that? Taught your kids how to make a hexagram. Do you have any idea what a hexagram is to somebody who doesn't understand the power of the blood of Jesus? If I made a hexagram against you when I was practicing witchcraft, you had to worry. Today, because of the blood of Jesus and the knowledge of that blood, you don't have to worry at all. Because that hexagram ain't nothing but a, a, a circle with a big star in the middle of it. But Papa Smurf taught your children, when he was in a confrontation, not to go and make peace with his accusers or his enemies. But he taught those kids. Did, I don't know if you people saw. Made a big pentagram in the, in the sand. Made, what? Showed your kids how to do it. Made the pentagram, the whole thing. Excuse me, the hexagram. Made it and started murmuring over it. Now, your little babies with their innocent minds sat there and learned that when there's a confrontation, when there's a problem, this is what Saturday morning the TV goes on. And then they see Papa Smurf, who's so cute, come out, and he's in a confrontation with some of the other Smurfs. So what Papa Smurf does is he draws a hexagram in the sand. How many saw that? Taught your kids how to make a hexagram. Do you have any idea what a hexagram is to somebody who doesn't understand the power of the blood of Jesus? If I made a hexagram against you when I was practicing witchcraft, you had to worry. Today, because of the blood of Jesus and the knowledge of that blood, you don't have to worry at all. Because that hexagram ain't nothing but a, a circle with a big star in the middle of it. But Papa Smurf taught your children, when he was in a confrontation, not to go and make peace with his accusers or his enemies. But he taught those kids, did, I don't know if you people saw, made a big pentagram in the, in the sand. Made, what? Showed your kids how to do it. Made the pentagram, the whole thing, excuse me, the hexagram. Made it and started murmuring over it. Now, your little babies with their innocent minds sat there and learned that when there's a confrontation, when there's a problem, this is what you do. Do you know how dangerous that is? There's a new movie out called We're Back. The dinosaurs are back. How many people saw it? It's coming. I mean, it's, it's, it's fresh. It's, it's a Spielberg. Everybody just loves Spielberg. I've never seen so much new age and so many sneaky things out of Spielberg in my life. I mean, he just gets... Woman, an unsaved woman said to my Christian friend, Jackie Goba, she said, Jackie, I went to see their back. The dinosaurs are back. It's just brand new. Spielberg put it out. It's coming. You're all, it's all going to be here. And she says, I don't think you would have liked it, Jackie. And Jackie said, why not? And she says, I don't know what it is, but for no reason at all, for no apparent reason, it had nothing to do with the movie. In one instance, he made some sort of a sign that looked like a pentagram in, 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 in the ground. She says, Jackie, it had nothing to do with the movie. I don't even know why they put it there. And it's a kid's cartoon. How many have seen The Nightmare Before Christmas? I have a folder here on The Nightmare Before Christmas, a write-up that I collected. Do you know the, what they said in The Nightmare Before Christmas? By the time we would get done, you won't have any Christmas left. Did you know that? I don't know where I've got it, because I've got so much stuff here we'll be pulling out. But I've got a little, there it is, The Nightmare Before Christmas. I walked in at the end of this, about a minute as it was ending. Everybody is deformed. Did you notice nobody's, cartoon characters aren't even normal anymore. They all got ugly faces, and they're mean looking. And like, did you see these cartoon characters from The Nightmare Before Christmas? Now this is going to come to Canada, isn't it? Is it here yet? It's here. Yeah. Look at the 12 graves of Christmas. Jingle bones. Have yourself a mortuary Christmas. Oh, Tannenbaum. Is that what your kids? This is what they're doing to your celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we take our kids for this for entertainment, folks. When they should be learning about Jesus, they're learning to look up to these idolic little weird little creatures. Jack Zero. Imagine the world's skillet, skinniest skeleton with a pumpkin head. And you've conjured up Jack Skeleton, the pumpkin king, the creator of Halloween. And look where they brought the Halloween. To Christmas. 
say, do you, do you see what I'm saying to you? I see it clear because I lived it. I can't believe. It says when we get done with Christmas, it says it in here, there won't be any. The evil scientist, Dr. Frankenstein, everybody's deformed, everything's weird, and they sing pretty songs. I have never seen so much witchcraft going into your children. I can't believe the things that we've taken our kids to see. God's whole plan was family. See, the devil hates family. He hates the family man. He, it's such a powerful unit. When a family's together, unified, there's so much power, people. It's spooky. There's so much power. So he's got to dissemble the family. Well, he can't come in and just tell you, break up your Christian family. So he sends you Bart Simpson. Rosemary. Rose, what, Roseanne. Married with children. These are homes that influence your life, your children, your kids, your husband, your wife. Let's look at Bart Simpson. If I ever got my hands on a little cartoon character, I'd, I'd squeeze his neck. <laughs> I'm serious. Here our kids are taught, love your parents, honor your parents. These little kids sit down and watch Bart Simpson. Now one particular time, Bart Simpson was sitting at a table. He looked up, this was his prayer. This is what your kids heard. Think of the signals. Hey God, thanks for nothing. We work for everything we got. That's what your kids listen to? That's how you give thanks to God, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. And they think he is the best thing since tossed salad. They love Bart Simpson. He's a wise mouthed little brat. And this is, this is the family unit. This is what your family is being taught, that this is how you talk to God. You, you wise mouth your mother. You talk back to your father. Look at Roseanne. Now, I, I think that Roseanne Arnold has had some really terrible things happen in her life, and I think she's a real sweet lady in a lot of ways, but some of the ways that they portray family, give your daughter condoms, give them birth control pills, and send them out. What about the Bible that says not to fornicate? It doesn't say in here to give them a pill. It says not to enter into immorality. It says flee fornication, flee youthful lusts. What are we supposed to do with this? Change it to suit Roseanne? I don't understand. I hear Christian parents telling me, well, if they're going to go out and do it, at least they're protected. I want to get sick. Protected? We'll get into that when we move up in another area. I don't want to move out of where I am now. We'll talk about all that. Roseanne, Batman. Batman. Where do these guys... Well, let's, let's finish with Roseanne married with children. The mother has a big mouth. She's a wise mouth woman. I've never seen her clean a house. I can't stand the sitcom. I hate sitcoms anyway, folks. I hate sitcoms. They bore me, period. I just don't like them. Give me an old, old movie that's nice and clean, and I can sit and watch it. I'm not against television, folks. I'm not a pure loony. Richard loves Discovery Channel and Christian television. My husband loves to watch an old movie, but the minute it starts coming with the trash, he wants out. He'll come out of the room like a cr what are you, what, what, what's on? It's like, I don't, I don't know, where's the channel selector? I don't know. <laughs> and I'm worse than him, and people know it. I've gotten into fights with very good friends over programs in their home. Saying, I can't believe you're letting your kids see this. What, what kind of a message is that sending to your child? What kind of a family orientation and family unit idea or ideal are they getting from what they just watched? Married with children, they call the daughter a S-L-U-T. I mean, what is that? She comes out half-dressed. The father sits there like a total dweeb. He don't know what's happening half the time. Bible says that he's the priest and prophet. You watch married with children, he's not the priest and prophet. He's a jelly belly nothing. The Bible says, wife, be submitted to your husband, but the signal is, wife, tell your husband what to do, when to get up, what to say, and embarrass him every chance you get. The Bible says, children, be obedient to your parents, love them, obey them, honor them. They turn on the TV set, the kids talk back to their parents. I'm going to tell you something, we got a problem. And 99.9% .9 is coming through your little box in the living room. Folks, if the, if the TV is not a god or looked at as such, why does every chair in the living room face it if it's not an idol? Come to church and find the farthest seat in the back. But boy, when that TV goes on, everybody, you always say, get away, the radiation burns on your eyes. Move back, you're getting radiation burns. Every chair in the room has to face the idol. 
People say, I don't hear the voice of God. Of course you don't, because the first voice you hear in the morning is your TV, and the last voice you hear at night is your TV. How do you think God's going to get through all that? And the toys the kids are playing with. Huh. The toys. X-Men! Uh, this guy's real popular. Him and, and, and the universe and, and, and the keepers of the stone and the troll dolls. I don't believe the things Christian children are playing with. How are they ever going to learn peace? That's what the kingdom of God is. Peace and joy and righteousness. These things will never, ever make it. X-Men. Check this guy out now. Wolverine is the X-Man's greatest fighter, a master of all forms of hand-to-hand -hand combat. I only know one master. His name's Jesus Christ. Has a fearsome secret weapon, razor, sharp, retractable claws that can slice through anything. Wolverine also has a reinforced skull and mutant healing abilities that helps him recover from all wounds. So now the children that are playing with this violent toy are learned that he can heal himself. He doesn't need Jesus of Nazareth because Wolverine can heal himself. His claws come out, and if anybody gives you a hard time, just get those claws out and cut them to shreds. Go for the jugular. Or take one of your nunchucks and hit him in the throat from your Ninja Turtle toys. Or give him a swift hit to the jugular, and that'll put him down. Or go and meditate to the ooze, and maybe that'll give you power through that rat so that you can have power over your enemies. Or turn on the, uh, the, 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 the Smurfs and learn how to do magic. Or watch one of your Disney things and learn that magic and sorcery and mysticism is an everyday life. And then we wonder why we got problems with our kids. God help us all. The toys. Then they collect cards. You know, kids love cards. Another thing I can't believe, these troll dolls. Everybody with the troll dolls. I remember how popular they got. Were they popular here for a while again? Do you, have you ever thought about, have you, have you studied the troll doll? Trolls live under bridges. They're evil. They come out at night. They got the big eyes so they can see at night. They got that ugly hair, which you can never fix, and it's orange. The kids are told to rub their bellies and speak to it. Now, when I was in witchcraft, I always believed in having a juju bag. And you put all kinds of things in a juju bag, you know, and you talked over the juju bag. It was crazy. But, you know, I can't believe I believed in all that mess. And, and you just fill that juju bag up. And there was always a transparency. You either chanted or you talked over things. These kids are taught with a troll doll, rub its belly, speak to it. Keepers of the stone is another toy the kids get. Hiding the stones, keeping the stones. They're taught to rub them, carry them in their pockets, speak to them. They carry power. What are these kids playing with? But the most powerful part of that child placed in your hands after it exits the womb and literally enters the world as we know it and is placed in the hands of the mother or father is located, ladies and gentlemen, right here. It's called the brain. From the time that that child is placed in your hands, mother, father, grandparent, brother, sister, whatever, who's ever there, whoever will be around that tiny baby, Recordings will begin. Everything he sees, everything he hears, everything he watches on TV, everything you read, everything you say, will go in the great recorder. It will be recorded in this incredible machine. You literally will create this child by what you feed into the machinery because he is what he eats. What he takes in is how he will respond. By the time that child reaches the age of accountability, you will have formed him by your deposits, by your recordings. What have you recorded, ladies and gentlemen? What has he watched? What entertains him? Does he get three and a half hours of cartoons here and one little prayer over supper over here? In the great recorder, what have you recorded? that will be life-changing and relevant for his total forming and growth and Christian walk. Parents, you created him. He is what he has been given. I have parents, and I say this at every seminar, come to me with their children this age, I've had it happen to me, and throw them at my feet crying, screaming, do something with that kid. Do something with that kid. And I pick that kid up off the floor and take him in my arms and I turn to those parents and I say, what have you allowed? What have you said yes to? What's in the recorder? You put it there. It's not his fault. He is what you made. He is what his big brothers and sisters have recorded. He is what mom and dad has recorded. 
What have you allowed? This child is a product of the recordings. I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston, I think is beautiful. It really is. Of course, it stayed on the box office heights for five months, so I'm not the only one who felt that way. But when you really stop and think of the majority of the music that's coming through the radio waves, through the television, there's an incredible amount, an incredible amount of sexual explicity in the lyrics. I mean, it's embarrassing. You gotta give it away, give it away, give it away. I want your sex. Some of the X on the music station, such as MTV, do you get MTV in Canada like we get in America? Our kids are on MTV civilization, aren't they? When I think you know what the only way to do is to read some of the lyrics. Now, don't get panic-stricken, pastors. I'm going to be careful. I give you my word. Because I've got pastors where she's going to read words. She's from New York, and she's blunt. Is she going to embarrass us? Let me show you something, teenagers. It breaks my heart that we come to church on Sunday. And during praise and worship, a lot of times our attention is diverted to the God who in the midst of our sins and our mistakes sent his son to die a bloody death for us so that we can have eternal life. And it is so hard for us to lift our hands up. Yet, rock stars who make more money off you kids don't have any problem getting their worshipers to raise up their hands to mere men. These kids, did, look, these kids can't reach high enough. They can't get up high enough, folks. Look at these kids. They're at a rock concert. Look at it. They're not ashamed. And they're lifting their hands to more mere men, mortal men, who will die and wouldn't bother to be there for you if you were drawing your last breath. Just keep making them rich. Their whole point is buy tickets, buy albums, buy CDs, make me rich, and as far as you're concerned, I don't care what happens to you. And these kids will raise their hands to them. Look at that. I see this, it makes me want to cry that God doesn't get half the attention that this gets. I don't want my friends to see me lifting my hands to God. What would they think? These people don't care, and they're raising their hands to darkness. Look at that. Look at these kids in frenzies. Oh, this kid can't get up high enough. I mean, he is gone faithful to their God. Let me read you some of the lyrics, and we're going to talk a little bit about rock music. I'm going to be talking about sex, but I have never been thrown out of a church when I discuss it. It's done very carefully. I promise you, Roxanne, Pastor Peter is sweating over here. <laughs> Motley Crue, not too young to fall in love, not a woman, but a W-H-O-R-E. I can taste the hate while I know I'm killing you, watching your face turn blue. These are what the kids are listening to. These are lyrics. Don't get mad at me. Some of it's going on in your homes. Out go the lights, in goes my knife, pull out his life, consider the blank dead. I have lost the will to live, simply nothing more to give. There is nothing more for me. I need an end to set me free. Put the bullet in the chamber, put the bullet in my mouth. Six to one, I'm going to make it. One to six, I'll snuff me out. This is what they listen to? Teenagers, what's going inside you? Are you, are we so, and I'm not putting you down, I'm reaching for you. Are you so cool that you really believe this will not affect you? That's a joke. I was at a concert, and, and Ray's sitting here. Ray grew up with, he knows the mess I came out of. With a guy, we went to a concert with Lenny Vichotic. He's dead today, he killed himself. Ray will tell you, killed himself. But we went to a concert with him, Richard and I, and we were all high on drugs, you know, and thought it was like really super great, you know, and all that mess. And we were listening to the music, and Lenny was standing in a bleacher. It was in an auditorium in America, and the, the bleachers go all the way up, and the place was packed. And they had what they called then quadrasonic sound. It was so new, it was a sound that just surrounded 
the whole stadium. And Lenny is standing there with a guy next to him. And way up on the top of the bleachers, a man stands up, a kid about 17 years old, and he's looking down, listening to this music. And he thinks, wow, this is so great, I can fly. And he jumped off the bleacher, four or five bleachers up, and landed on the guy standing, I don't know if it was right in front of Lenny Vichotic or right beside him, and killed him. Two policemen were saying that they went to a concert and they, it got so violent because now the thing at the concerts are to throw somebody up above. Have you seen that in the MTV now? They throw somebody above and then they, they're on their hands. Do you know how they toss? Respond, so I know if you've seen it. Do you know what I'm talking about? And then when they fall, they all kick them and beat them up and stuff. And, you know, it's a big thing. And then sometimes the rock star will jump right into the crowd and land on their hands, and they toss them around and put them back. They'll put him back because they want him to finish his gig. But somebody that gets tossed around in the audience is thrown down on the ground usually and beat up. They have broken legs, broken arms, some eyes have been put out. Did you know that? Policemen were saying that at one of the major concerts, I'm not going to name what, they were taking a young man out 14 years old and they said they had him under their, their like under his arms and they were dragging him because he wouldn't walk they said that they were dragging him and he had a nosebleed his nose was bleeding all this is real folks and they're dragging this 13 14 year old kid out and he's dragging his legs and his nose is bleeding and behind him is a boy 16 licking the blood as they drag him this is what is going on. Folks, this isn't affecting our children. These words, these images. Madonna put out a book. You know, if you're sitting there and you're getting shocked, what I'm saying up here is not shocking. Turn on your TV tonight for two hours and it'll make me look like I'm Cinderella. Let them watch a few commercials or go through the Sears catalog. This will look like Mickey Mouse Donald Duck. Because you know what? I'm so sick and tired of the devil having a grip on the body of Christ. I'm so tired of our kids being messed up, our teenagers wandering off into things thinking, you know, this is not going to affect me. Our ear gates and our eye gates taken in filth. Our kids don't know why they're full of rebellion, why they're full of fear, why they're falling away from God. They don't understand that what's going in is messing them up. You can't play both sides of the dice. You've got to choose what you're going to do. It isn't a game anymore. Usually when people get into witchcraft, Satanism, or the occult, what happens is the first thing the devil needs you to do is to break your protection. Don't miss this, kids. Please don't miss this. There is a commandment with a promise attached to it. Listen to me. It's the commandment, just one, honor thy father and thy mother, that your days may be long and all may go well with you. That means obey and honor your mother and your father that's all god's asking out of you obey and honor two things the whole bible that he wants from you young people obey and honor and the reason he's telling you that is because he has attached a promise of protection longevity and health to you things will go good with you so when you get involved in any shape or form see this any shape or form in even dabbling a little bit the first thing he wants you to do is he wants rebellion in your heart because it's just, it's, it has witchcraft. It's as powerful and as strong. They go hand in hand. See what I'm trying to say about witchcraft? So when you get into rebellion, you don't honor your mother and your father. So that protection comes right off you. He doesn't have to do anything to you. You'll do it to yourself. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why when people, young people, get involved in these things, the first thing you'll notice is you'll turn against your parents. That's the first, did you know, first thing. You listen to a lot of violent music, a lot of music that's coming through the TV, that's coming through your CDs, that's coming through your earphones, filling your head, recording all that in your mind, rebellion, violence, sexual promiscuity, vulgar language, hatred, enmity toward God. When you get in that condition, he don't have to do a thing. You will destroy yourself. You will run into your own problems, and you have nothing protecting you. I have a friend named Joshua Jones. His mother has been speaking, 17 years old, his mother's been speaking over that kid since he was a little boy. She taught him the Word of God. And I'm not talking about a queeby, geeky kid. I'm talking about a really nice guy. 
She spoke over him, Joshua, you've obeyed your mother and your father, you've honored them, your days will be long and all go well with you. One day he was riding down the street with his aunt in a van. And the aunt did not look, notice that there was a gigantic truck coming in the country where no cars come. All of a sudden, on the clear blue sky, she pulls out in this oversized van, Joshua sitting without a seatbelt on. She pulls out into this lane, you know, out past the stop sign, and a massive utility truck with a real big spool on it is coming. And it slammed into Joshua's side. He died three times. He was th crushed in the head. He got nailed at 55 miles per hour. He got hit in the head. With that thing, just hit him head on, 55 miles. Smashed him, threw him. He was a very strong, large kid, about 200 pounds. Threw him on top of his aunt who was driving, who went into the intersection by accident. Crushed her pelvis and was dead. If I walked, and all his mother said over his body, when he laid there all, you know, he's going to die, face the facts, he'll never talk, he'll never, all she kept saying is, he's honored his mother and his father, don't say that, he has a covenant, he honored his mother and his father, my girlfriend, best friend, Denise Jones, he will live and will not die, I have a covenant with God, he's perfectly fine, how did he come out of that? <laughs> he honored his mother and his father and the devil couldn't kill him even though he tried, you see the point? You gotta keep the protection. That's a promise, and considering who made the promise, I'd run with that one. I mean, when God makes you a promise, you can take that to the throne of grace. That one's solid. Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. Here's a game, ladies and gentlemen, that some war enthusiast, Gary Gagax, made. He sat down one day and he put this game together. He called it Dungeons and Dragons, him and his friend. He put the game on the market, nothing happened, absolutely nothing. So he pulled the game off the market and he called his friend. He said, let's pick up the game more. Let's get 21-sided dice. Let's get characters. Let's get all kinds of sorcery in it and witchcraft in it. Let's hype the game. So his friend said, I'll throw in a thousand bucks. Go ahead. So Gary and his friend built Dungeons and Dragons. They got Dragon Masters, really built the game, really got the characters where you had to literally live those characters in, either to, in order to get the treasure, really move in that game. He puts it back on the, on the shelves, it doesn't sell. Now a mathematical genius in Michigan State University, a millionaire son, bought the game. He just happened to be walking through the store and saw the game and thought, this is all right, I'll try it out, because it's a mind game. He took it with him home, he started playing the game. Then he took the game, he got so caught up in the game, he went down into the steam ventilation system of Michigan State University College in Michigan. Stayed there for two weeks, didn't eat nothing. Just stayed down there with the game, playing the game, taking on his character. Now steam ventilation is when the steam will come real quick and it'll shoot down and shoot through these ventilation tunnels. So he had to always be on guard not to get in the way of the steam. So it was a challenge to him in his character and it enhanced the game to him. For two weeks he stayed down there. He finally emerged pale, gaunt, hungry with the game under his arm. Well the media got their hands in it, did a big write-up in the paper, the game that year made two million dollars. Today it's one of the top selling games. You go in bookstores, it's one of the few games that has their own section to themselves. Can you imagine that? Monopoly would love it. I mean, they got the whole section, Dungeons and Dragons, books, follow-ups, it's one of the fastest selling games. 168 deaths are attached to Dungeons and Dragons. You might say, well, you know, listen ladies and gentlemen, one death attached to Dungeons and Dragons is too much for me. These kids said, a game, folks, it's just a game. I had a woman come to me at one of the end of the day, she goes, I don't know why you're attacking Dungeons and Dragons. And I said, I never attacked the game. I told you about the game. If I attack the game, honey, you're going to know I'm attacking the game. I talked about the game, sweetheart. I told you about the game. I read you stuff. She said, well, I don't know. I play it with my kids and the neighbors. I said, that's wonderful. That's just wonderful. Daytona Beach, after being stalked, strangled, and raped, the young runaway was subject to a final abomination. Her body was burned to, sa to Satan. Tammy was eliminated as if she were a Dungeons and Dragons character. They were becoming, here's, here's another one talking on the coalition of TV violence. They are going to become desensitized toward violence. They're going to be prone to murder. All this, look at, here's a picture 
I, just time won't allow, it's already after nine. Just the write ups. You want to read them, come see them. Kids playing Dungeons and Dragons. I'm glad my name isn't in here as a victim. It could be, you know, and so could yours. Because these kids that killed these people, these different write ups, they were just normal kids. These were not kids out of detention homes. These kids were not drug addicts. These were middle class, normal kids, just like you see here. But they went as far involved in a role playing game to kill someone to fulfill a character in the game. My involvement into witchcraft came through my girlfriend Linda and I playing Ouija. What happened was we began to tap, playing a Ouija board. And now, people, a Ouija board is a game board. Most people see it as a game. Ouija means we oui is yes for, in French and ya ja is yes in German. So it's the yes, yes game. It goes all the way back to Confucius, all the way back to the Romans. It used to have a pencil on it, and they used to do a lot of automatic writing with it. It had all the symbols and signs of Satan on it, and it had the astrological signs on it years ago. And they used to write it, use it, calling spirits to enter and to do automatic messages, write automatic messages with this little thing, this little pin that you have now. And it would just write out messages on the Ouija board. Well, after a while, the game got a little extinct. Then they, the, the board got a little extinct. They brought it back, washed all the signs off. It cleaned up real pretty. Took the pencil off and put a little pin on it and put it in the hobby shops. Parker Brothers sells it, just like they do Monopoly, same shelf. Sean Sellers, who was involved in Satanism and killed his mother and father at 5 o'clock in the morning, Sean Sellers said that the greatest initiator, the biggest endorser, the biggest thing used to bring people into the supernatural is the Ouija board. Let me tell you kids something. You pull a Ouija board out, you better think about what you're doing. Let me tell you what's happening to you. I told you there's two kingdoms, right? There's a kingdom of God and there's a kingdom of Satan. There's no in between. If God says no divination, no sorcery, no necromancy, no wizardry, nothing, then on his side there's absolutely no use for the supernatural outside of what this Bible teaches in regards to the kingdom of God. If you want to know, well, let me do it the way I always do it, like the way I do it on television, and maybe you saw me do it on TV. There's the kingdom of God. You've got to put it up higher than the kingdom of Satan. In the kingdom of God is God. God's cool. He's just totally awesome. He has shared his throne with his son, whose name is Jesus. In his kingdom are myriads and myriads and hosts and myriads and billions of angels. The rules of his kingdom and what is part of his kingdom is in this book right here. It's called the Bible. If you want to know anything about the kingdom of God, get a Bible. It'll tell you everything from soup to nuts. It's here, folks. Now there's the kingdom of Satan. He's here. He doesn't share his throne with every, anybody because he's selfish and stingy and hateful. In his kingdom of darkness, he has my raids and my raids of evil spirits that are dispatched at his bidding. Now, when you take a Ouija, and if you want to know his book of rules, it's the opposite of this book. Anything that this book says, his is the opposite. You don't need a book. He don't need a book. He hates everything in this. So if you want to know what goes on in his kingdom, it's the opposite of what goes on in God's. Now, when you pick up a Ouija board or you have a seance, or you go to a spiritualist, which I'll be covering on Sunday night. Anywhere you go and you begin to tap into the spirit realm, if it is forbidden by God, he does not respond. That thing on the Ouija board does not move by the power of God. The spiritualist does not speak by the power of God. Anything that starts to happen when you seek the supernatural is coming from this kingdom. Anything that has to do with divination, sorcery, wizardry, magic. I'm so tired of people telling me they're going in churches and doing magic tricks to bring people to the kingdom of God. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ doesn't need any gimmicks to get the gospel out. What is that? You know, we're going to go and we're going to do karate. I'm going to tell you about karate too. Don't let anybody tell you that they're doing karate for the kingdom. The root of karate is not the gospel. It's Eastern religion. God doesn't need anybody kicking a guy in the head to get the gospel across. 
What he's got to do is preach the word. It's full of power. It's full of truth. It is the power of God. We don't need all those gimmicks in the church, folks. Just preach the word. Just be a witness, and that'll get them. And nobody needs to do a magic trick or kick anybody in the head in a little white short pants that look weird on anyway. They look like pajamas. I'm not impressed. So when you begin to tamper in sorcery, divination, spiritualism, mediumship, anything of that nature, the minute you touch it, the very minute you touch it, this kingdom responds. This one won't. It forbids it. The book forbids it. So where do the spiritual powers start coming from? From this kingdom right here. So when you get a Ouija board out and it starts moving because I've played it and it worked. The minute, I in, the minute I played that game, the very minute I played that, started playing with that board, powers immediately showed themselves. Richard will tell you. They showed themselves immediately. Because I was tapping in a spiritual realm that is forbidden of God, he does not respond. So don't ever come home from a medium or call a psychic network or read something in astrology or do something that is on the opposite side of the fence and say, well, God did that. No, he did not. He does not go against his word. He has nothing to do with it. Any responses, any messages, any fortune telling, any information, any accuracy in your past, present, and future is not coming from the kingdom of God. He said, have nothing to do with them. So it's activated right here. Do not be playing Ouija. Do not be having seances. You activate spirits of darkness. And kids, don't be messing with things you don't know anything about. You're not bigger, tougher, or smarter than the devil. The only thing smarter than him is right here. If you got this on your lips, you're very smart, very powerful, and very enabled. Don't play with fire. You'll get burned. There was a young man. His name was Johnny. It's a true story. His parents were Christians. They made him go to church. He hated it. He said, church is boring. I hate church. My mother prays all the time. She embarrasses me when my friends come over. I hate it. He used to go to school and complain about his Christian parents. So he hung around with a group of people. And his mother told him all the time, Johnny, stay away from them. They're bad news. Oh, my, you just don't like us. They don't go to church. I'm so sick and tired of this. When I'm old enough, I'm going to do what I want. She said, when you're old enough, you can do what you want. But in this house, we're going to keep that straight path to God. You get out, do what you want. On his 18th birthday, his mother and father went to a Bible study. It was his birthday. He told his parents, I'm going out with my friends. They came and picked him up in a car. They said, Johnny, tonight, man, is your night. It is like your night. They put him in the car. They took him to a bar. He drank. He says he drank so much it made him sick. He said they lined up cocaine on a mirror. He sniffed all this cocaine. He said it was blew his head off. He said all night, he said what he wanted to say. He made all the crass comments. He mocked his parents. He just couldn't believe that finally he was free from that religious stuff. They put him in a car about 3.30 in the morning when the bars were closed, and they said, Johnny, now, man, you are out from under all that moralistic, legalistic garbage. Do what you want. They put him in the car. They drove to a motel. They took Johnny out of the car. He could barely walk, opened the motel room. Sitting on the bed was a teenager girl. She was about a 19-year-old prostitute. He said he doesn't remember anything about it. He doesn't remember being with her. He remembers nothing. He woke up in the morning. He was unclothed. He had nothing on. She was gone. He says he had such a splitting headache that he crawled to the bathroom. He said he pulled himself up in the bathroom door. The light was on in the bathroom. He says he pushed the bathroom door open. And he said she had written on the mirror over the toy, over the sink, happy birthday, Johnny. Welcome to the world of AIDS. He's dead. Happy birthday. We're in such a hurry to get out there and experience. You know, kids, when I was a teenager, we didn't have the transmitted, sexually transmitted diseases that are out there now. I just did a television program on sex in the 90s. They're saying now that they have sexually transmitted diseases they don't even have names for. They have a new one out. I don't even know the name of it. I don't want to get into it. That's not what I'm here for. I'm just trying to make a point. That if you get it, it'll kill you. And you can't even see it, and you don't even know it's there. Madonna gets up, who's washed up now. They don't even bother with her anymore. She gets up, and she sings. It doesn't matter if there's multiple partners. It doesn't matter if you're with women or men. It doesn't matter what you're with. It's OK and it's cool. Do what makes you feel good. Be free. These rock stars and these rappers get up. They sing about violence, racial slurs, racial violence, sexual comments that are so bizarre, I can't even say them from the sacred desk. So sick. 
talking about murder, killing, your sis getting with your sister, being with your mother. I mean, it's sick. This is a temple of the Holy Ghost. This is a temple of the Holy Ghost, folks. What's going on? The devil hates your guts. Time's too short to play games with you. He hates you. He doesn't like you. He doesn't want to give you power. He doesn't want you to be cool. He doesn't want you to advance. He wants you to be stupid. You see, he loves stupid people that will involve themselves in things where he can get control of your mind, your thoughts, and your emotions. That's what he wants. That's what he wants from you. Once he gets his hands on your brain, once he's got you right at that place where I ain't gonna take anybody's orders, I don't have to get all this God stuff. Once he's got you there, he's got you exactly where he wants you. And he will, he will kill you. He will. I don't have anybody calling me up asking me to get in witchcraft. I got more phone calls. You could ask my husband Richard of kids begging me to help him to get out. Get me out. If it's so wonderful to be a witch, if it's so wonderful to be involved in all these things, then why does anybody want to get out? Why did I get out? Why aren't I still there? If it's so wonderful, and I had power. I could walk in a room like this and embarrass people. I had more demons than you got hairs on your head. I had more spirits working at anything I wanted. I could get any guy I wanted. I'd get any drug I wanted. Just because I was operating and hanging out with the devil. And when he got me exactly where he wanted me, when he saw that I was, t and I wasn't killing children. I never hurt a child in my life. I never slaughtered an animal. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I didn't do stuff like that. I never harmed a human being. I'd send out incantations and spells and, and, and psychic prayers and work that kind of power, but I never hurt a child. I never drank blood. I never did any of that. And I had 11 demons. All I did was dabble, listen to music, read some books, studied some books, studied some, some things about the occult, studied astrology real deep, learned the trades of witchcraft, but I didn't hurt anybody. I was a white witch. I was believing that I was this really cool white witch who would never hurt anybody. But see, witchcraft, white witchcraft, is whitewashed Satanism. There isn't any clean witchcraft. It's all whitewashed Satanism. I had a woman, Eileen Rogers, that I, that I uh, you might have saw on the program. I interviewed her on the program. She was a witch since she was five years old. I mean, she was next in line to be Satan's daughter. I mean, it was bad. Her name was Eileen Rogers. God got her. She's like a Paul. She's out getting everyone saved. She's out breaking his kingdom to pieces now. But she told me, she said, Carol, it amazes me how, and, and she didn't mean it bad because she was saying it to me like talking, I, her testimony makes mine look simple really, but she was talking to me like, do you believe the things that Christians allow? She said, why don't they see it? I said, Eileen, because they didn't live what we lived. They don't know. They, you can't, you don't know. That's like me looking into a wound with a doctor and trying to explain to him what I'm looking at. I don't know, I never saw it before, but the doctor did. So you see, when you look through spiritual eyes, now washed in the blood and filled with the Holy Ghost, and you see people dressing up their kids, games in their house, Nintendo toys with weird stuff, teenagers walking around with earphones. You know, they're in church on Sunday, they don't even want to raise their hands, but man, you give a Marky Mark, man, and they're like, there, you know, it is so, you know, and whoa, you know, it's great. And then the Son of God comes along and they're embarrassed that their mother prays. Something's wrong. Something's very wrong, ladies and gentlemen. It, it, it's, it, this is the reason why the church is hurting. How can God dwell in our homes? Teenagers, listen to me. I got a daughter, her name's Marilyn. She's the only one I got. Let me tell you something. I wouldn't let you touch a hair on her head for your sins. I wouldn't let you touch a hair on my baby's head for what you did wrong. I'd let you pay for your own sins. And she's just a person. Yet the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was willing to die for you. Which one of your friends are going to die for you, kids? They got too many of their own problems to be able to take care of any of yours. At 4 o'clock in the morning when you call them up, you get a screaming maniac telling them you got problems. You call Jeremiah 33.3, 3, that's Christ's number, God's number, and he will not hang up on you, and he will not tell you to call back in the morning, and he will take care of whatever it is that hurts. Think about it. Kids, listen to me, teenagers. 
We, we can't play with this anymore. You can't get in on your mother's faith and your father's prayers anymore. You're too big. You can't play with toys anymore. It's time to go on to something bigger. You have to stop and say as a young person, I have got to make a decision who I'm going to serve. This is not a game, kids. Listen to me. This is not a game. This is serious. Let me tell you something. This gospel is drenched in his blood. He takes it very seriously. You're not going to get in on mother's hanging on mother's shoestring. You got to get in on your own faith. And God knows what you're doing. It's, it's so serious. I, I wish to God we all realized how serious all this is. This, these games of Christianity, this social club, bless me club, it's, it's, it's not going to work, folks. You know what? If this is the end of times and the way things are right now, I'm surprised Jesus didn't come yesterday. But if this really is the end of the age, as bad as it's getting, I mean, the one world government, this NAFTA or something we're coming into now, I don't even understand all those political terms that, you know, everything. You know, I took my bank card, folks. I took my bank card and I put it in a Buffalo banking system, used a Florida private bank. It wasn't even there noted. I didn't use my MasterCard. I used a Florida private bank called Barnett Bank. Richard and I needed some cash. I stuck in my MasterCard. I had a little bit of a problem. I don't know why. So I pulled it out. I said, well, so I said, well, let's try this. And Richard was like, that's a private bank. And I put it in, went right through. We are, I tell you, we are in a one world system. We are headed. It is so close. Our kids are on the streets killing one another, shooting one another, beating one another. Gangs are going crazy. Think about it. How long do we have? How long can we play the church game? How long are we going to play the game? How long are we going to come to church on Sunday and watch R-rated films? How long? Teach our children that the Spirit of God is the greatest power on the earth sent by Jesus. He said, I'll pray the Father, he'll send you the Holy Ghost, the comfort of the paraclete, one called alongside the help. He will be with you, and we drag him into trash. Our houses are filled with trash. Nintendo games, music in the bedroom, mama's in the kitchen praying that daddy's headache goes away, and the kids are in the bedroom with those earphones on, flipping out to all the latest rap music, singing about all kinds of craziness, turning on TV, weird family lives, cartoons that teach our kids to freak out, movies that are nuts. You know, folks, if we put as much money into the basket when it goes by, as we do in, in video game, I mean, videos at, the, at, at Blockbuster and all these big video stores, We'd be a rich church. We'll pay six bucks for two films to listen to GD, use the Lord's name in vain, filthy four-letter words, sexual nudity, and we'll put that money out there in that, in that video store without a thought. Bring the card out real proud. Yeah, that's right, that's my card, I want these. And then the basket goes by and, what do you mean you want my money? What do you mean you want my money? Think about it. God help us all. There's a movement called New Age. New Age is vast, there's a lot of it. But it's seeping into Christianity. It's getting in. And some of the w things that they do in the New Age movement are being practiced by Christians. It's very dangerous. I practiced Eastern religion for I'm not sure how many months. I was really into it though, very into the meditations, very into the astral projections, very into to, to all of it, getting down into different states of consciousness. I was into all of it. It's extremely dangerous. But because the children of the world now are having problems coping, they're trying to find new methods to calm them down. Many of the schools, many of the colleges are interjecting transcendental meditation. I was at Pastor Benny Hinn's on a Sunday and he makes us sit in the front because he wants us in the front praying if there's a need. He called us up one day and I went up to a little girl to pray about 13 years old and she said, I don't know what to do. Little Christian girl, I said, what's the matter, baby? She said, at school the other day the teacher told me to get, to invite the spirit. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, Carol, I already have the Holy Ghost, but the teacher said invite this spirit guide that he would help me with my homework and he would help me with this and he would help me with that. And I said, the teacher? And she said, yes. And now he torments me all the time. And I had to pray for her. It's getting in.